Welcome everybody to our encounter lesson for this week. My name is Chris Fleming. I am the adult ministries coordinator for the ministry council of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And with me is the Reverend, right Reverend, um, Rebecca Zarty. And I will let her introduce herself. And I am the director of ministry for the ministry of with women. Oh my goodness. Start that over. I am the director of ministry with women for the ministry council for the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. There, now there we got go. it in. And hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's uh, encounter lesson. Glad you could join us. I'm glad to be here myself. And um, Reverend Becky's in a new spot. She's at uh, the office there in Memphis. So um, we're hanging out in Cordova. Right. Okay. So one of the things that we're going to ask if you watch this regularly and you haven't, and you haven't hit the subscribe button, do that. Um, and if you will, like the video if you like the video if you don't don't like the video um but uh, uh that helps us out just to show up in more search engines or whatnot and so there's that make and sure if, you share us share and this share video us, share and share you know? um any announcements that we need to make for the denomination stuff i don't think so i'm just getting excited if you haven't registered yet for convention or general assembly uh, please do so. We would love to have you. Convention's going to be super exciting this year. We got a lot of stuff planned. You can check us out on Facebook at Women's Ministry of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church and see all of our event flyers and things that we have going on. We've got a lot of really cool stuff coming up. So make sure you register and join us this summer in Albuquerque. All right. So we are going to continue on. We were in Acts last week and now we are. Um, we're going to head over to Philippi. And so we're going to talk about Acts road tripping. 16, road tripping around. Um, this is obviously after um, Saul becomes Paul, known as Paul, I guess. And um, now we're going to see one of the one of the many times that Paul gets, you know, persecuted in some way, shape or form. So Acts 16, 16 through 34 is our text and our Prayer for illumination. Gracious God, when our circumstances seem bleak and dark, you shine the light of hope. Shine on us today, illuminating our hearts to receive your word. Amen. And our memory verse uh, is from Acts chapter 16, verse 5, I think. Is, no, 31. Sorry. 31. They answered, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. So that's a cool promise that we got. Uh, and then we're going to start off with a little bit of a reflection on hope. Uh, that's how uh, we're going to start today with Reverend uh, Newell and the discussion question. I'll just start with that, actually, and then we'll, we'll flesh that out. When was a time you felt hopeless? When was a time when hope was all that kept you going? Mm. You want to jump in? You got any I experiences? do. I have a great story to share about this. And it's not my story. It's actually my husband's story. My husband's name is, is Chris as well. Um, and when I read this, it really jumped out to me, this whole idea of hope. Because we have, uh, my husband and I have been married 24 years. And obviously things aren't always, you know, grandiose and sunshine and roses, right? We have moments where it's very frustrating. Um there was a time in our marriage when we had moved from the state that we were living in closer to his parents. And for a little while, we were actually living with his parents while our house was, was being put into place. Um, and my husband was just going through a lot of stuff at this time. Of course, our marriage was kind of at one of those moments where we were rocky we were frustrated with each other um he was having a hard time with employment and things because we were living closer to his parents <laughs> him and his mother were like clashing at this moment in time so that didn't help the situation and an accident happened at work and he lost his job and he was just so frustrated and he he said he remembers he was walking across the parking lot to the car. And I mean, just literally just sobbing. He lost his job. You know, things were not great with his mom. Things between him and I were kind of frustrating at the moment. And as he was walking across the parking lot and he was like looking down at the ground because he was just so 
despondent at that moment, just so frustrated with what are we going to do? What is he going to do now? How are things going to work out? And he's seen this little thing on, on the ground. It was a little keychain and it looked like a little, little die, you know, a little dice. Um, and the sign that was facing up said hope on this keychain that he found in this parking lot. Very good. And he bent down and he picked it up. And it was just, for him, it was that reminder in that moment, not to despair that yes, things are really frustrating right now and things are just, they look terrible, but to hope. Yeah. And, you know, this happened, oh gosh, probably going on 20 years ago that this took place. And he still has that keychain. Um, and we can't get rid of it because for him, it was just a reminder when he was in this dark place that hope is still there. Hope is still out there. So that's what I wanted to start this off with. Hope. Hope. hope yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I would assume if you're teaching this class or if you're a student, I'm, I'm assuming you've been in a place uh, of what you felt like is hopelessness. It's now, you know, the other thing would be like one person's trash is another man's treasure. I mean, like somebody might view what you thought was hopeless. They might not have even batted an eye, but that's neither here nor there in the sense of when we feel hopeless, we feel hopeless, whether, whether we should or not. And kind of what we're going to get into the story. I mean, like if anybody should have felt hopeless, it was probably Paul and Silas and, and then they didn't, or of course they had hope. But then, then you right. had this episode with the jailer who at one point was on despair, almost going to kill himself because he had lost a lot of hope and he didn't need yeah. to. Uh, and so I say that to say we all get, um, we all get in situations where we feel hopeless, I guess. Absolutely. Um, and, and I have too, uh, but I won't, one of the things I remember when I was working with um, a lot of, you know, substance abuse um, yeah. folks. Um, I remember, um, of course, there's a lot of dynamics in that. I don't want to say that it's easy, but one of the things that for sure um, contributes to someone becoming healthy again or getting off of substances is that there is a hope or a vision of something greater. So like when you get to the point to where you've lost hope, a lot of times substances, you know, alcohol, whatever, become a way of either ignoring it or finding some kind of higher security that, but when you get to a point, there has to be a vision or there has to be a hope of something better that's stronger than, than whatever you're getting from that substance. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, um, it may be that you hit rock bottom, you see your family and you say, yeah, my family's living a good life with my family. It's a vision that overrides the lower vision. Right. And I think the reason why hope is so important for Christians is because this world's dirty and there might go extended times in which you don't have a whole lot of fun and you could lose hope, but you have the vision of, you know, Christ seated on the throne and the throngs of Christians from all times and all places together in a, in a resurrected body and you don't have sicknesses anymore and you don't have conflict in your relationships anymore. That's the power of like Isaiah, like when he has this vision of a lion laying, lion laying down with the lamb or a child putting their hand in the nest of the vipers, but nobody kills on, on God's holy mountain. That's a vision worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. And so when things get bad, you remember that vision and that, that gives you hope to keep moving on. Absolutely. Um, So on the bottom, right before the exploring the scripture subheading, I love this last uh, sentence that Jennifer writes. Hope means we believe in a bigger story. We hold a longer view or at least realize that there's more going on than the discomfort or disappointment or heartache facing us right now. For a person with hope, bad news is never the last word. That's right. That's pretty awesome, actually. That is, that is huge. So good job there, Reverend. I think you encapsulated mm-hmm. that really, really well. Um. Anything else really on the introduction? Did. No, I think that's just, I think that's a great way to start this story that we're going to encounter with Paul and Silas. This is what we need to keep in mind as we read through this. 
All right. So as you said, we're on a road trip. So the historical contextual setting is a little bit different than it was in last week's. But she starts up and she talks about the the word curios or curios uh, depends on how southern you are um, and the meaning of, of lordship. Um, and then she talks about Philippi and then talks about the natural disaster that enabled uh, Paul to escape prison. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'll just, I'll say, I'll start it there. And then finally she ends with, you know, the, the jailer, but anyway, yep. I'll start it up and, and we'll say, take us around the block there, Becky. Sure. Okay. So Philippi, um, I really like that she brought out that it was named after Philip of Macedon, which is Alexander the Great's father. We forget how important Alexander the Great and the whole Hellenistic Jew, uh, Hellenistic, the Greek culture was such a huge part in, of the story um, because that was several, you know, that was quite a ways before Jesus, but how much that played into the story of Christ and what was going on in that time period. Um, so it's an, important to remember that. Um, she gets into the spirit of divination. And I know we wanted to talk about this quite a bit. She talks about the Oracle of Delphi um, and how important this was. For us, reading back on it, we're like, oh, the Oracle of Delphi, you know, and if you know the history, the context of it, um, what historians believe is, is, and I don't think that was mentioned in here, but what historians believe is that there were, um, in the place where the Oracle was located, they found like fissures in the temple floor. And they think what was happening was that the, the gases from the volcanic structure underneath were like leaking up into these fissures and um, that the Oracle, the women at the time um, would basically get like, I don't know how to say it other than they would get high. Um, they would smell this, the gases that were coming up and then they would have this vision. Um, and it was so important and we cannot, we cannot stress enough how important these Oracles were to the culture at the time that Kings would travel that military leaders would travel, politicians would travel hundreds of miles to come to the Oracle, to make their request to the Oracle and, and get that reassurance of, right. of what it was that they were going for, you know, whether it was political or military might, they needed to have the reassurance from the Oracle that they were pursuing the right path. This was incredibly important. And if you've ever watched the Matrix, um, the Matrix does a great, has a great example of this for our modern day society about people that were consulting the Oracle before they would make a decision. Um, and this, this is an important part of the culture um, of, of what was happening at that time. And there was something else that you want to talk about the Oracle. Oh, when the Oracle, as much as it was like, I like the picture that we get in this narrative lectionary of the city of Damascus, which was mm -hmm. a hustle and bustling city. And then Paul is converted. But then you switch over here to Philippi, which isn't as much of a, it is a big city, but the Jewish uh, population wasn't right. Wasn't right, as big, right? Wasn't as big there. And so, but we see that the gospel then still translates, right? From a place that has a heavy Jewish population and, and the Holy Spirit converts Paul. And then he's over here in Philippi and not a lot of Jews there really culturally non-Jewish at all. In fact, it says, you know, they didn't even have a synagogue, which meant that there was probably less than 10 men, at least in that neighborhood. Um, so they didn't even have that, but then Paul preaches the gospel and the Holy Spirit's still active and the Holy Spirit uh, overcomes any of these divides that, that we sometimes think, you know, I don't know how many times I've been to the church and they say, well, the neighborhood changed. You're like, well, but did the spirit like, did God yeah. like, right. You know, so I think it's neat that we, that we say that I wanted to read uh bottom of the, that where it says spirit of divination, the bottom of that, where it says foretelling the future was serious business in the ancient world, politicians, businessmen, um, military leaders, all consulted oracles before undertaking big plans. Mm -hmm. and so like this was super important like this was incredibly um i i was gonna do extra work and try to figure out how much money uh is spent on um like 
still today palm readings and fortune tellers yeah. and card fortune divination tellers. and these kinds of things. Um, it's Tarot not card a small readers. business. And it's still popular today. And then something that I noticed with my children, my daughter especially, maybe it's my, I don't know, but there's been a huge rise in the use of uh, the astrology things, you know, the signs mm-hmm. and the stars or whatever else. And it, it blows my mind. Like horoscope readings, horoscope readings. They like, yeah. uh, I remember there were some kids at church, you know, or well, in the neighborhood and they were like, how can you believe this stuff? And then one of them asked what the horoscope was. I'm like, wait, what? Like what's the, at least what's the difference? <laughs> like anyway, right. Um, it's a, uh, it's just something that I've noticed that like people will really put a lot yes. of money into this kind of thing. Oh um, yeah. And a lot of, and a lot of faith in, yeah. and I think that goes back to the reassurance, what, you know, we're talking about the Oracle in the ancient world. And it was these business leaders, these politicians, military leaders that needed the reassurance that what they were pursuing was the right thing. Right. And I think that's what, in our culture, why it's such a big thing is because people are looking for that reassurance. Am, am I pursuing the right mate? Am I pursuing the right career path? Am I pursuing uh, the right opportunities for my life? And we need that reassurance that we're getting through these external factors, or we feel like we're getting through these external factors instead of consulting God first. Yeah, I don't know what the disconnect is. Or like when I have a conversation with people and they're like, well, you know, they're telling me the story about two people. One of them's a Gemini, one of them's like a Leo, whatever that means. And be like, obviously they didn't get along as if like the time of birth or the, like, I don't understand this. Right. I have effect on these things, but it is big money now. And I think what we're supposed to be really understanding in this is that it was big money then. And so it, that, you know, the slave girl, uh, had the ability evidently, or the, at least the, uh, the, she had the spirit of divination. Yeah. And the reputation of being able to foretell these things, right. And, and, and divine. And so she was the cause of others making money. So we can't forget that. That's a integral part of what happens. One of the reasons being is, is because you can see the biggest offense that Paul did, it wasn't necessarily because of his faith. It wasn't because he was preaching or anything. It's he got in the way he, he healed someone of a, of a spirit. Yep. Again, you would think praise God. Not exactly because that got in the way of making money. Now what are these folks supposed to say? How can we use this woman now? Um, and I think Jennifer brings up, I don't know if she does, I think maybe later on, but it's like, it's later this on is a London, blessing yeah. and a curse in the sense of this girl's healed, but now she's in the world's eyes, completely useless. Right. Like, so this is a thing that'll keep coming up, like good things, but maybe looked in the wrong way, bad things. But we'll, mm-hmm. so we, I guess we can go on to the the earthquake Mm -hmm. thing here so yeah i mean like earthquake plays a prominent role and so if you want to pick that up and run with it yeah so it was a it was a prone match said macedonia is an earthquake prone region so i mean this this happens earthquakes happen but this particular event it was a life-changing event you know for paul and silas but also for the jailer if we look at the jailer because of this earthquake, he was about ready to take his life. Right. But thankfully he didn't. Yeah. And how much that, you know, and if we look at, if we look at today when reading scripture, we go, oh, that was a, God caused the earthquake and how amazing that was. Praise but at Jesus. the same time, you know, I mean, thinking about the whole money aspect, then also let's look at God caused this earthquake. And it was great for Paul and Silas and eventually great for the jailer. But then there were also other things that happened that people would see weren't so great. Right. You know, you know, homes destroyed. You know, we don't know what happened. Um, but that's an interesting, we always have to remember the, the two sides to, to this story. Yeah, she brings it up at the bottom of page 65. It says, although we often speak of natural disasters as acts of God, 
This one mm-hmm. clearly was exactly that. God at work through nature to accomplish kingdom building, chain breaking, and door opening work. Mm-hmm. And, and I think yep. that's the thing. Like, um, I guess it depends on on what side of the fence you're on. Yeah. Um, whether like a natural disaster was a good thing, but you know, mm-hmm. we don't know. This it would be pure speculation to say like you know people lost their houses i'm I'm sure they did I mean, that's right. what earthquakes do but that's right um you know it it's one of those things to where we see like it it worked well for paul right and mm-hmm. eventually worked well for the jailer but but god moves in mysterious ways yeah. uh and by faith we can view something like the the jailer the flipping jailer for instance by faith well, he didn't have any at first because no. So Paul and Silas could see this earthquake. Well, he did great... have faith. He did have faith in the humanity. He did have faith in humanity that yeah. an earthquake happened, the doors opened, and, and in his there. mind, everybody's going to go away. Yeah. Because what would you... yeah. he had faith that people were going to react the way that he expected them to react? That's true. What he didn't have so faith. A different in... faith or a wrong faith. Yes, the wrong yeah. faith. Wrong faith. I think that's right. Well, so yeah, that's true. And and so talking about wrong, so like an earthquake happens, Paul understands it as a as a blessing from God. Yes. An earthquake happens, the jailer thinks I- immediately that he's going to lose his life because he was irresponsible in this act of God happened. Then in the story, his faith was changed to the right faith. Like God is in control of these things, right? And so that's that's a cool part of the story, but it just kind of depends on where you're at on, on how you yeah. understand. Um, let me show you. I'm going to share a screen. Um, Easter weekend. This is a good example. Um, let's see if you can see this. Can you see a? Yeah. This? Okay. So this is from the New York Times. Um, and this was a opinion, a guest opinion columnist that uh, had issues with God and religion and so the title is in this time of war i propose we give up god and he goes on to talk about like and he brings up the um, exodus story where when he was young he was a jewish person grew up and you know he learned that uh, god killed all the firstborn of the egyptians Mm -hmm. and he says you know in my class yay my classmates cheered right um and he said you know, in his view, he had grown out of his faith and he didn't understand the stories or whatnot or didn't value the stories. And he was like, that's atrocious. Like I I was in a classroom with all of my co-classmates screaming for joy because God killed um, the Egyptian firstborn. Um, And that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is his ancestors were freed because of a mighty act of God. Right. So how do you, again, uh, how do you choose to look at, I mean, both, both of those consequences are true. Sure. And there's got to be a context or a faith by which you say God has a greater plan than I can understand. Or you can have the faith that says a bad faith, as you brought up, God's mm-hmm. a terrible being. Mm-hmm. Um, but by faith, I think we, I think I feel comfortable in saying that we would say that, no, God has this great plan that's working that's more than we can understand absolutely absolutely so anything else on that yeah dig any further i think that brings us down to the end of or bottom of page 66 where jennifer says the jailer thinks that he can predict the future and that he's so certain that he stakes his life on it and she goes on on page 67 to say it's it's reasonable it's rational it's responsible but it was it was wrong. And she also points out how we do this in our own life, <laughs> which is so true that we jump to conclusions about other people and we suffer for it. It's that to me hit home. And as a teacher, you know, I hope maybe this would be some eye opening, some, some opportunity to discuss and think about. We like the jailer jump to conclusions that humans are going to react the way we expect them to react or to hold opinions and philosophies and theologies the way that we think because of either previous action or uh, 
our experience that they're going to say that way. And it's not necessarily true. And, and then God we end up suffering for it. Yeah. And God, God abs- I mean, if you would have took me from, I have to think about how long I've been in the church. Um, so 15 years ago, right? If you would have taken me as a human being 15 years ago, your conclusions about my behavior, my actions, my attitude, my personality are going to be completely different than if you meet me today, because God worked on me. God changed me and God God showed me. uh, Yeah. Thank goodness. It was a miraculous thing, you know? So when we're having conversations with people, that's something that we really need to think about is not to jump to conclusions about what other people are thinking. Yeah. So in this, and I'll give you a more practical way to think about it in the church, another practical way, not a more practical Mm -hmm. way as individuals, that's what we do. But the discussion question is what responsibility shackle us in what ways do our, our certainty sometimes make us blind to what God is up to. Um, So one of the things I learned, like most many Cumberland Presbyterian Church are in the same boat as everybody else in this sense, not enough money, not enough time, not enough volunteers, not enough, not enough. And we can rattle off the not enoughs. And when somebody like, let's, you know, at a church, you think somebody has a great vision that God is leading you to do something. And the first thing you do, you're reasonable, rational, and responsible. We don't have the money. We've tried that before. We can't do it. We're too old. We blah, blah, blah. And that's wrong. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. It because is wrong. God it is does wrong. a miraculous thing. Right. Yeah. Just like, just like happened here with the with the jailer. There is no reason in the world if you're in jail and you get the jail, get on a jail free card, you're not going to take it. Except right. God's working. God goes against everything that we think imaginable. Yes. Everything we think is reasonable. Everything we think is rational. Everything we think is responsible, and God says, watch this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hold mm-hmm. my Bible, God says. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. I love that because it's so true. And it's even with like pastoring the two churches that I pastored for the last four years, our conversations were as long as we were following what we felt that God was leading us towards, as long as we continued pursuing that path is what we did miraculous things in places and spaces that we didn't think were possible, that we didn't think we'd have enough money, that we didn't think we'd have enough volunteers or time. And then I look back over the last few years and I go, oh my goodness, look what God did because we were faithful and committed to what God asked us to do. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. So I would say uh, pastors and uh, Sunday school teachers, people in the church, remember that. I think she's right. Reasonable, rational, responsible, and wrong. Um, especially if you're operating out of fear and not grace, operating out of fear and not the spirit, operating out of fear and not the leading of God. Amen. I think Amen. Check. Yeah. Digging deeper. <laughs> Bam. Going on. All right. So the comparing the uh, scripture to scripture, uh, so you have a demon possessed girl. And so Reverend Newell brings up the, I uh, guess, garrison dem- demoniac. There you go. Um, there we go. And, and kind of highlights the fact that the demons both recognize God's power immediately. Right. And they speak right. up. Um, so anyway, I think what I'll do then is just start with this discussion question and then we'll, uh, we'll go on from there. Paul speaks to the spirit, not to the girl. He is able to separate who she is, and what she is doing. However, it is the girl, not the spirit, who stands to suffer. She is healed from her demon possession, but her life is very much in peril now. Once a profitable property for her master, she is now useless to them. Was Was she released from slavery when the demon lost its grip on her? Or now that she has no value to her master, did she lose whatever benefit she had enjoyed as their quote unquote golden girl? That's, that's a, that's a real thing in a couple ways, but I'll let you. That is a very serious question because it all goes back to, again, your perspective. Um, She was freed, obviously, from this demon possession, but now her life is what, you know, what is her value? What is her worth? What is, what is she going to end up, you know? are her masters going to release her from her slavery? 
Um, so what does she do? That might be yeah. worse. Yeah. Then where is she going to go? Who's going to take care of her? Who's going to feed her? Um, who's going to clothe her? Or is she, you know, does she have any other skills that the master can use? And I don't want to speculate on that, but you know, I mean, there's just, there's all these situations. So is she in worse situation now than she was before. We don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a great question, but it, it also is, it also goes back to as a Christian and, and we're going to, I think this is where we can dive into this thought process is as a Christian, we're not guaranteed a good life, a blessed life, right? We're, we're, we are guaranteed that we're going to have troubles, that we're going to have uh, problems and, and that we're going to be persecuted. But at the same time, Christian, and I really want you to, to hit on this, we're not guaranteed that we're going to have a bad life though, either. I mean, we are, you know, maybe hit on that at this point. I'll hit on that a little bit. Uh, well, first I'd like to address what you said, like, like there's an old um, spiritual, uh, African-American spiritual, and it's, you know, before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. In some sense, it's the power of that vision. Like being a slave is terrible, but like what happened to the Israelites when they became freed from slavery and then they got, in, you know, going to the promised land, they were scared yeah. because they were like, hey, we're going to die here. It's better to be a slave than to be dead. They hadn't got the vision of the promised land yet in their soul, right? And maybe the slave girl will have to do the same thing. Hopefully the vision of what God has in store for her is greater than the comforts, and this sounds weird, the comforts of being a slave, right? Sure, sure. I mean, there's there's um, a certain comfort in, in already being in what you know yeah. is going to be the outcome. You're, I mean, it's, and I, and I don't mean to offend in, in this manner, but if you think about people that are in abusive relationships, why do they keep going back to the abusive relationship? Well, it's the devil that they know. The devil, you know, they, under, yeah. they understand the outcome. They already know how this is going to play out, even though it's bad. They mm -hmm. already know that this is, and they're comfortable. But if you put them in a situation where they don't know how the right. person's going to react, even if it's better, I mean, better, a betterment for them, it's, mm -hmm. it's terrifying yeah. because they, they don't know how to react to that. And so that's where, I, that's where I'll go back to the very, it's the vision has to be so felt and so good and so committed to that you keep moving forward, even when it's, when it's bad. But what you were saying, like, you know, a lot of times, and I'm one of those preachers that do that. I think I, it, any sermon that I do, I could, I can somehow get back to pick up your cross and follow. Right. Sure. And so like, you know, I could be talking about Psalm 100 and praising the Lord and then just pick up your cross and follow. Pick and up your cross. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes, um, which I think, but I think that's the key. And I think that's the key to it all. But like, we talk about Christianity a lot of times as there is no guarantee that life is going to be great. Sure. But there's also not any worry in asking your, you know, your heavenly father for the blessings and benefits that a father wants to give their children. Yes. Right. So like, um, and I say this, we had a pastor that came in to the Cumberland Presbyterian Church from a more charismatic background and you know, I'm not going to say word of faith, but pretty close to name it and claim it. Um, and he told me one time, he's like, no, I don't necessarily believe in the prosperity gospel, but I also don't believe I'm going to feel poor all the time. You know, right. so I think there's something to that, how we understand prosperity, how we understand the good life, you know, because there's a lot of people who have a lot of stuff, but they're worried and stressed and they would say their life is terrible. And then there's people who have nothing and their life is great. Yes. You know, so again, it's a, it's a, how you operate by faith, how you see things kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. The other thing I'd bring up, because I think this is important and, and I think it's misunderstood or it's so I like in her question, she said, Paul is able to separate who she is from what she is doing. And, and I think that there's a, so he, like, there's a love the sin, hate the sinner or love the sinner, hate the sin kind of yeah, phrase yeah. that we use. And sometimes we use it in the context of different fights, and I'm not going to get into any of those. And some people say you can't, you know, you can't uh, say that you love someone, and but you hate what they do. That's not the way. But it's true. That part's true in the sense of every day I look in the mirror, it's self-evidently true. I love me, but I hate right. a lot of the things that I do. 
Yes. Uh, and, and now I always think of that Romans passage, you know, and Romans seven, I guess is what it is. The things that I want to do, those I don't do the things that I hate do. that I keep on doing. Yeah. 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 So yep. I think there is a way that we can minister to people because we do it to ourselves. Like yes. if I actually like, or if you have kids, I mean, yeah. you know, I, golly, I love my kids. They're yeah. amazing. But sometimes the things that they do stupid Gosh. <laughs> you know i just want to flick them between the eyes and say what the heck is wrong with you uh but i think if you ever use that phrase the you know love the sinner hate the sin or hate the sin love the sinner i think it has to come from a place of actually love yes and that might be the difference when somebody says that and they really don't have a prior relationship or an understanding any empathy or sympathy toward a situation or group right. um you know, people say that to justify their feelings about something more so than justify their love for that person that right. they might be talking about. So that's important. That's a good point. Good point. Yeah. Um, what else we got on that digging deeper section? That oh, oh then she going. gets into salvation. I really yeah. loved her whole philosophy of thinking about salvation. Um, you know, because salvation for for the Greeks and the Romans was about peace and prosperity. It was this really about just a good life. Kind of a utopia you know? kind of thing. Yeah. She says here, safe roads, clean water, easy travel and trade and end to conflict. This was salvation to them for the people under Roman control. And that got me to thinking about how, when we talk about salvation in Christ, is how are we presenting salvation in Christ? And, and is this any different for us today? Because if you talk to I think you just talk to the average person on the street, you know, for them, they're, they're going to be looking at the same things that the people under Roman control, you know, good roads, clean water, easy travel, um, an end to conflict, peace, just this utopia, utopian type society is what they're looking for in their life. Um, and, and when we talk about salvation in Christ, <laughs> that's not the same thing. No, and that's the struggle that we got in our, like, that's the struggle I'm sure that happened. But back then, I mean, like, Mm -hmm. there's this sense, you know, it's like, uh, it's like the Jews when, when Jesus talks about like being children of Abraham and they're like, we are children of Abraham, like everything that they had, they were satisfied with in their mind, they were saved because they were, they were externally focused. Right. And, and Jesus is like, yeah, you got some work here, brother. (laughs) Right. And, and I think today we do the same thing and you can see it in, in, in the way different churches approach ministry. Sometimes like I went to a conference and, and, you know, somebody said, you know, heaven is, is on earth. And, and so their goal was to make sure nobody was persecuted. Nobody was hungry. Nobody was abused and nobody, and that's all great, but that's where it stopped. You know, the lady even said, you know, heaven is earth. And I'm like, no, 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 heaven, mm-hmm. heaven's not earth. You know, it's not peace and prosperity on this earth. It's your soul right before God your sins yes. atone for. And again, right. even in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, as I say that, there's going to be people who probably disagree with me, but I disagree with them on, on if they... Right. But here's the thing, there's an in-between there. Like, right? Yes. It goes back to Paul's theology that we we've talked about before, that the kingdom is here, but not yet consummated. Not yet consummated. You know, so we have elements of the kingdom that are here that we should be working towards th- taking care of those who cannot take care of themselves that we should be working towards sharing the gospel message and, and giving people that understanding that their eternal salvation is capable, you know, that they have confidence in the fact that they are saved. Um, but it's just not, it's not going to be, it's not going to be utopia. No. So no. Um, I don't know how long we've gone in this. I think we're in good timing. But yeah, so good. like one of the things that a lot of church people have been introduced to in the last couple years would be things like liberation theology or, um, you know, critical theories. Now, like, here's the thing, like you can disagree with those things, but especially like liberation theology, a theology starts because there's a need to correct something like, right. So imagine, so like when you're preaching the gospel and talking about somebody's soul to a bunch of people who are needing bread they need bread still they need bread so like liberation theology started on these um you know south american countries to where like priests in their like you know thousand dollar robes were stepping over poor folks to get in their church 
and then you would just carry on your gospel preaching as if nothing was wrong outside the church door. And people were literally starving to death in the farms and the fields. And so obviously a theology goes up to say, y'all have missed it, right? Like something's wrong yeah, here. Yes. You're disconnecting the body from the soul. And that's not good Christian theology either. And so that's where it starts. I mean, like wherever it ends up, you might disagree with, but it started because there was a misplacement on what salvation was. And it, and yeah. again, like I said, it, it slingshots to, to the other side. When you focus only on heaven, you miss the body. If you focus only on the body, you miss heaven. You miss and heaven. So it's a, it's, it's a both end. end. Yeah. It's a both end. And there's it's a both end, you know, so I think that's important to know. And I'm glad she brought it up. And I like these yeah. things. Um, we're in on page 68. She says, what are the many situations outside of a church in which a person might cry? What must I do to be saved? When the doctor says it's cancer and you got X amount of time, salvation's different for somebody who doesn't, doesn't know faith or the church or that addicted person who knows that they've hit rock bottom, opened up the trap door, gone down a little bit more, you know, or yep. when the, yeah. And I've seen this with my own daughter. It's when the despondent team reads one too many harsh comments on social media, mm -hmm. like, right. Like those, those aren't, none of those are probably eternal but they're real. Yes. And my gosh, the church has a call to minister to the now as much as the future. Yes. Right. Yes. And I totally agree. I think too many times we get so earthly mind or so heavenly minded that we're not earthly minded yeah. and how we take care of these people and how do we reach them here and now so that they have both the assurance and the hope that that go hand in hand. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. I think so. I think it's important. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I think we also just, we constantly need to examine ourselves and make sure we're operating from faith and from the spirit and not from like clicks or clubs or social stances, because I, I mean, like anything you disagree with on this earth is it's probably come up because there was a real problem right? Sure. Whether it's a policy in, in government, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, a theological stance, people didn't just say, I'm going to make somebody mad by thinking this, <laughs> right? I mean, like there was, or, a, yeah. there was an issue or something that needed to be brought up. And so I think then we gain knowledge and wisdom when we at least explore, you know, maybe that's not the right answer, but this probably wasn't either. So let's try to figure out a good response of faith, like the Philippian jailer kill himself or to continue on. Right. I mean, right. We, we try to respond in the real faith and good faith. Um, yeah. All right. I think we can leave that section. There's more there. We obviously can't cover everything all the time. And I guess we got on a tangent. So there you go. Okay. Um, so learning from the scripture, not as long as of, of a, uh, of a section here. So I'll just open that up to you and uh, you can walk us through that or just pick up something that, yeah, I really love how she talks about that the situation that Paul and Silas find themselves is beyond their control. Wow, and what they do instead, I mean, it, it is. I mean, really, it is. But instead, what they do, instead of worrying about what they can't do, they do what they can by worshiping God. And so many times, That's I think trick. that is so important for our lives because as a pastor, something that God and I struggled through quite a bit was how do I, as a pastor, change people's lives and make them see Jesus? Yeah. What did God and tell the you? Answer, the answer is you can't. There you go. <laughs> you can't. I cannot force my family members who don't believe in Christ. I cannot force anybody who doesn't believe in Christ to believe in Christ. What I can do that is within my control is to preach the gospel message, to share the good news of faith, to share the hope of salvation, and to offer my praises and my prayers and worship as loud as I possibly can. And it being an example and exemplifying Christ to the best of my ability every single day to every person I meet. That is what I can do. Yeah. 
I cannot make people change their mind. Nope. Nope. You can't. And you, you don't have control of situations. I like on nope. the, the last sentence in that uh, section on page 69, whether evangelizing was their intention or not, Paul and Silas's decision to worship God in the midst of so much suffering and hope proves to be a powerful testimony for Christ. Um, and I've thought about this. Like, I think every parent who has a kid over the age of 16 or 17, depending on your state, um, when they get their driver's license and they leave. Yeah. Maybe they leave for their first little road trip, leave off for college, it's the first time they've driven, you know, and of course they're not going to call you. And you have no, yeah, it's right you can't here like, in the back of your throat. You're not sitting on the passenger side, so you can't like, you know, passenger side brake when you need to, or you can't. And you can worry about that. And I think that leads to stress and it leads to burnout probably on because people do that with every situation or you can worship and you can acknowledge that God's God's in control mm -hmm. in some way. And I think that I think that's cool because we live in a real stress filled world. And I bet a lot of it is because we think we can fix something. Right. And I wonder well, we instead can. of stress, we make ourselves worship. I wonder how that would help the blood pressure or help our outlook in life mm. or, or these kinds of things. I don't know. Something to think about anyway. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. In jail, praying. What yeah. can you do about it? You're in jail. Fine. You're in jail. I mean, they were shackled to the wall. What could yeah. they do? You know? So again, Praise by faith, God. what's your response? By faith, is it you worrying? Are you trying in your own power to do something? Or is it by faith you're you're saying? Uh, the Lord give, Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Let's land <laughs> this puppy and apply that yeah. scripture, Reverend. She she really pulls this together with worship. And in the beginning of sharing, applying scripture, she's like, worship is not about a building, a day, or a set of religious habits. Worship is, as Jesus points out in his conversation with the woman at the well, is a matter of spirit and truth, not time and place. That's a good one. Preachers, worship, that worship. preaches. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Worship is a matter of spirit and truth, not a time and place. I think that is yeah. so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I um, really love how she put that. Yeah, I like the next the next sentence. Worship is our response to the truth of who God is. And, and that's mm -hmm. in every situation. Again, the ones you can control. Man, but there's also like we always talk in the negative as preachers but there's also those times like that are just pure unadulterated joy and goodness like yeah. fellowship time with your kids when nobody's yelling or complaining about anything or you just see them do something in there it's fun and you're just your heart's glad because their heart's glad yeah or in your marriage when like you're on vacation and you're sitting in the beach and you look over and say i married that good looking person right like i mean yeah and you just have this total yeah. moment of peace and contentment yeah. I, praise I, god right there yeah praise it's god there and it's worship in the bad times but it is still worship yeah. um yeah. and i think that's what so i'll just read that too when we understand even a little bit about god's majesty we offer uh, god our praise when we recognize god's hands and our blessing we tell god thank you when we catch a glimpse of god's holiness we move we're moved to confession and that's mm -hmm. so i mean like i think that's uh pretty awesome um well let me uh go ahead and say that read this uh, our discussion question or application question discuss the following passage from the cumberland presbyterian directory of worship which is in it's in your confession of faith it's combined there so if y'all mm -hmm. want to look that up um, as human beings we also realize that we worship out of a sense of need we are not sufficient unto ourselves and we experience a sense of completeness and fulfillment through the encounter uh, with and uh, encounter with and worship of our creator to worship is to be fully human. What do you think about that? I, I, think I loved the end of that. To worship is to be fully human. We are meant to worship, which is why every culture, every tribe across the time and space have worshiped something because that's what we're, we're created to worship. Or respond. Yeah. And, and so to be fully human is to worship. And so worship God. Yeah. Mm. I, so, you know, I teach um, world religions class over yeah. at the college. And um, because I hate grading papers, um, my final exam is you have to talk to me for about 20, 30 minutes just to decompress the class. What did you learn? What you didn't learn? And all that jazz. And 
Um, and then one of the questions that I have is, was there something in class that you just didn't want to bring up because you were embarrassed to ask, or you just didn't think it was too important, but you had the opportunity to ask me now, what is it? And um, one of the youngins asked, you know, what does it mean to be, um, I forgot what he said. It was, uh, oh, um, what, do, what does it mean to, to worship or glorify God, right? He was a Presbyterian. So if you're a Presbyterian, the Westminster Catechism, the first question is, what is the chief purpose of humanity? And the answer mm -hmm. is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. And so he's like, what, what does that mean? And so I asked him a question. I was like, uh, you know, imagine you had kids because still young and hadn't had that yet. What do you think would make you the happiest? Um, and he said, my kids having fun. I'm like, yeah. So we're created in the image of God. And God created this place called the Garden of Eden as a playground. And God takes off one whole day to do nothing but fellowship with those created in the image of God. And so I was like, you know, that's how we're, that's how we glorify God and enjoy God is by being yeah. fully human, playing just like, again, imagine your kids, you take them on vacation and you watch them play at the beach. That's more fun for you than it is for them because they're being all that they're created to be. Yes. And I think that's uh, that. I love that directory of worship. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's it. I mean, like we reflect God when we're yes. enjoying God, right? Yes. And then I yeah. think that's good when we're enjoying that fellowship, that communion yeah. that we have. Yeah. As stupid when as we are, as much as we make a mistake on a thing, <sighs> if we're the like time. the Philippian jailer and we think, "Oh, I was lost. Let's kill ourselves." Yeah. Even in spite of all that, like God loves us, has put us god's image in us and 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 wants us to just enjoy being in that image and reflect yeah. that image. that's yeah. awesome so worship this week yeah enjoy true, it unadulterated love and worship worship this week with all your heart all right well thank y'all guys um mm -hmm. i think yeah next week's uh 11 so we've got three more full weeks before before we start the uh, summer quarter and that's going to be um i think it's summer quarter spring summer winter fall um yep. that'll yep. be dr george estes uh is giving us lessons on Ecclesi job and ecclesiastes so i'm really looking forward to that that's something we don't get into a lot Absolutely. or the wisdom books there um and so looking forward to it may the lord bless yep. you keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious unto you may the lord turn his face towards you and give you peace amen amen